Blessed be our God forever and ever. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray together this portion of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. Yet you are the Holy One. 
our forefathers put their trust in you. They cried out to you and were delivered. But as for me, I am a worm and no man. All who see me laugh me to scorn. He trusted in the Lord, let him deliver him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. Be not far from me, for trouble is near.
seated. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across, across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers, together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked him, Who are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so that if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of them, this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, you are not permitted to put anyone to death. 
This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he inflicted, indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king, for this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was abandoned. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they dressed him in a purple robe they kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to him, said, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, we have a law and according to that law, we ought to, he ought to die because he was claimed to be the son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at the place called the stone pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was a day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. 
When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A full jar of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. in the name of the one who suffered and died for us. Amen. On this Good Friday, we pause life to recall this dramatic event and life-changing event from some 2,000 years ago when the rabbi Jesus was betrayed, arrested, tortured, and then finally killed and hung upon that rugged cross on Calvary for nothing more than the perception that he was a threat to the people in power at that time. In the beginning of the Passion narrative, according to John that you just heard read, we find Jesus, Peter, and the other disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane being confronted by Judas, who was accompanied by a detachment of soldiers. With a kiss of greeting, Judas betrayed Jesus, causing his arrest. Peter's instant response was to defend Jesus, and so he drew his sword and struck the ear of the high priest's slave, Malchus. But Jesus' response, however, is key to understanding the whole passion narrative. Jesus says to Peter, put your sword back in its sheath, Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? Similarly, in the Passion narrative according to Matthew, Jesus says to Peter, 
put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen this way? Only Jesus knew the certainty and the necessity of what was happening to him and to his friends. For the disciples, it was a terrifying event. Their teacher and friend, the Messiah of God, had been arrested, bound and taken away from them. Most of them fled the garden, and only Peter and another disciple following Jesus. Eventually, as you heard in the Passion narrative, Peter would deny knowledge of Jesus as a way of distancing himself from the terror that was unfolding in Jesus' arrest. The question of why might have been on every disciple's heart. Why did the Messiah of God, who was to save them from the persecution of the religious and political authorities, need to die, especially in this horrific way? Why did he not call out to his father to send the 12 legions of angels to force his release? Why did the disciples feel so scared that they could not even defend their teacher and then denied even knowing him to save their own life? Why was all this happening? The question of why resonates with a lot of people today. The devastation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic has raised the same question. Why is this happening? And why is it happening to me? People from across the world, from all faiths and from none, are asking the question, why? It is a question that might have formed on your heart as well this past year. When suffering comes into our lives and indiscriminately tears through them, upending our plans, our health, our freedom of movement, our finances and our families, it is very natural for us to ask, why? We are, as a human family, extremely fragile creatures, made of tender flesh and blood and reliant on air and water to survive. Yet we are endowed with an incredible ingenuity, creativity and resilience. And we hold these characters of life in balance and live into life, making of it what we can. But Jesus was made of the same tender flesh and blood as us and experienced the range of human emotions that we do. He was God, but also very much human as we are. He was not spared suffering because of who he was and was not spared a horrific death. In fact, he purposely, if not reluctantly, walked towards suffering and his own death. Today of all days is a day to remember the end of Jesus' human life, knowing as we do the promise he made to his disciples that he would see them once again. Jesus knew this was his path, and he followed it even though he had the power to escape it. There was a larger purpose in his suffering and death. And this is where we might find solace in the good of Good Friday. As we well know, the whole human family suffers at times in our lives, as this is a part of our human condition. Suffering is not God's punishment for our sins. It is not God's wrath against a planet that exploits its weakest members. It's not, a, um, it's not an exploitation of our environment or then anyone that glorifies exporting heroes. Suffering is just part of life and we all experience it, some however disproportionately. The God we know as the creator of the world and the sustainer of our lives through the Holy Spirit through mercy and forgiveness and through love and comfort is ultimately good and true in all aspects. The world that was created out of nothing is wholly good. 
and goodness is inherent in everything. However, sometimes the good and goodness is corrupted, often by the selfish motivations of some people. St. Augustine famously said that evil was the privation of good and, the going, and that going wrong of creation in some parts. Today, all across the world, people are seeking their own way out from the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. Many want the suffering, suffering and the crippling restrictions to end. In our facing up to all that is happening, we might see evil in its origins, evil in its indiscriminate path of destruction, and evil in the forced isolation we have had to endure and the knowledge that many people have died alone. Certainly there is evil intent in the people who try and exploit this situation or in the people who terrorize their families with increasing levels of domestic violence. On this day of remembrance of Jesus' last few hours on earth, we too can see evil in what he experienced. Evil in the portrayal of Judas through, though he later repented, but the damage had been done. Evil in the religious authority scapegoating of Jesus, led by Caiaphas, who said it was better that one man die than the whole community. Evil in the treatment of Jesus and the cowardness of Pilate. And finally, evil in the torturous death he suffered, crucified to a wooden cross, saved for the worst of criminals. The prevailing goodness, however, in Jesus' death was his resurrection three days later, in which he defeated death once for all. He demonstrated to his uh, friends and his disciples first before the whole world that holding faith in the living, good and merciful God would enable us to move through life and physical death to a new life without losing our inherently deep connection to our Creator. And you'll hear more of this on Easter Day. The goodness of human life and community is evidenced in the tireless work of the frontline people in this pandemic, the hospital workers, the epidemiologists, the pathologists and other scientists, the technicians and the support staff, and all those who have worked to make our lives easier and more manageable. Goodness is found in the love we have for one another, the sadness we share as we mourn the dead and grieve with the living, and the desire that we should build more inclusive communities once again on the basis of fairness, equity, and mutual respect. Jesus lived goodness and put himself last as a servant for all people. He willingly allowed himself to be a sacrificial lamb that was so craved by those that did not put any faith in his message of hope, mercy, justice, and love. Today, despite our sorrow and suffering through this pandemic, we can also take time to focus on the goodness of Jesus Christ, the legacy that he left us by showing us the way, the truth, and how to live life. Today, we do indeed live the good and experience the bad. Today we give thanks for the sacrifice of God's Son, Jesus Christ, and remember that without the suffering of what we recall on this Good Friday, there would be no celebration of Easter Day. Amen.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent His Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, that all who believe in Him might be delivered from the power of sin and death, and become heirs with Him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Lawrence, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, that God will confirm the church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth, and for those in authority among them. For Joseph, the President of the United States. For Kamala, the Vice President of the United States. For the Congress and the Supreme Court. For the members and representatives of the United Nations. For all who serve the common good. That by God's help, they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase, until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded and the disabled, for all in adversity impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, for those in loneliness, fear and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, for refugees and immigrants and all who seek shelter from violence, that God in God's mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of this love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ. For those who have never heard the word of salvation. For those who have lost their faith. For those hardened by sin or indifference. For the contemptuous and the scornful. For those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples. 
for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We glory in the cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world.
Let us now stand and confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, Son Jesus Christ, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all of your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. As our Saviour, Christ, has taught us, we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever.